so that it's not quite. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again and again in uh, HIPAA lectures. Today we have a very special uh, subject. We don't normally or we don't often uh, give these lectures. It's about filmmaking. I think a lot of you may convert from still to film. It's the best opportunity here. Or if you wish to combine your uh, photos to convert it to film, also it's uh, there is one here very specialized also in filmmaking. Yeah, <laughs> you, we can consult him <laughs> afterwards. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I told you today, we have this filmmaking by Mark Williams. We welcome him, nice, and uh, we will have about two and a half hours lecture and. Uh, don't forget, these our lectures are uh, live stream. If you, if some of your friends uh, didn't make uh, didn't make it to come today, you can send him the link. You can find it on our channel on YouTube. As usual, we will have 15 minutes break. If you wish to pray, you can proceed for gents. You can proceed to the ground floor. There is a prayer room for ladies. You can go to the room next to the reception. This is a sign for ladies during the lecture's time. I hope you will have a very nice and wonderful, interesting lecture. And enjoy. Please. Thank you. Hi, th thank you, guys. Um, just by, by way of introduction, I actually started my career as a stills photographer, as a photojournalist at News Limited in Sydney. I worked on a whole bunch of newspapers over there and ended up on one of the big broadsheets. And, in 15 years, I think I shot about 9,000 assignments. And um, I got out of it just before it all fell off a cliff. I think anyone who's worked as a photojournalist knows how, how little work there is around now in photojournalism. Um, and um, I ended up in advertising. And then moving through advertising, I ended up in the creative department. And so what I managed to do was to get the kind of creative skills that come with how to develop ideas and then also mix that with the technical skill of how to actually shoot uh, pictures. And um, so merging those two things together, I started my own content company. And uh, so as a result of that, I work with a lot of big brands around town. And I kind of bring a nice mix of, you know, sort of very photographic, very visual work combined with ideas. So um, uh, I just wanted to also check before we start, like just ha uh, because I've got a presentation that covers a lot. You know, we go from creative into technical into production and so on. But I just wanted to try and get an idea of where everyone was at, so that I can tailor it a little bit more towards your needs. So um, who here are working, um, like professional working photographers uh, and filmmakers at the moment? Okay, one, two. There's a few, three, four. Okay. Um, how many are, 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 are want to move into, you know, professionally move into filmmaking? And actually, uh, okay, there's a few hands. Okay, very nice. Yeah, yeah, great. And okay, awesome. No worries at all. So what we'll do is we're, we're going to tackle a lot to do with creativity. And I've got lots and lots of work to show you. So some of the work is mine and some of the work is not. Because I wanted to show you the best practices. And I've deliberately gone for ideas and films that are not over the top. These are things that you can do. Like if you've got the idea, you can shoot this. So I wanted to keep the films that we share in the realm of our, our possibility, that we can do this, right? So, okay. So the art of filmmaking is, of course, building worlds and creating an entirely new sense of reality. And this is something that a lot of people forget. When you show up on a set, like, it, like for instance, we would a typical example would be uh, you want to do a Maggie shoot for Maggie, let's say, and it's happy families, and it's for Ramadan. So you get a villa, you decorate the villa, you, you get your cast and so on, you get up there, and then you're shooting the script. And 
very quickly, you're, you, you, because you're shooting it, you realize, oh, these are the cast, and that's the, you know, the, the props in the background, and so on and so on. But sometimes it's easy to forget you're actually trying to build a world, a world that's immersive for the people who are going to be watching the film at the end. So this is the kind of the, the basic touch point that we've, we start with. You're building a world, an entirely new sense of reality, and you're using the interplay of the visuals, music, and dialogue to, and, um, to create these emotional responses within people, and that if we do it well, it feels real. So our job is to manipulate the emotions of the viewer, because at the end of the day, as we know, all art is manipulation. So keep that in mind, because we're going to see lots and lots of work here today. Some of it's really funny, some of it's really emotional. And when you see it, you're going to be completely immersed. But you've got to keep in mind that actually behind that film, there's 80 people standing there as the cinematographer shooting it, and there's a whole process going on. So I wanted to kind of show the strings today of how it all works. Okay, so here's um, Alfred Hitchcock, you might, you might know him, and he's talking about this art of how to actually create this uh, manipulation. The assembly of, of film and how it can be changed to create a different idea. Now we have a close-up. Let me show what he sees. Let's assume he saw a woman holding a baby in her arms. Now we cut back to his reaction to what he sees. And he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. He's sympathetic. Now, let's Take the middle piece of film away, the woman with the child, but leave his two pieces of film as they were. Now we'll put in uh, a piece of film of a girl in a bikini. He looks, girl in a bikini, he smiles. What is he now? The dirty old man. He's no longer the <laughs> benign gentleman who loves babies. That's the difference. That's what film can do for you. So there you go. So that's exactly, he kind of nailed it, was um, uh, that just moving one piece of film completely changes the context. So um, now, to demonstrate this, I've actually got a beautiful piece of film shot by Roger Deakins. It's a film called Jesse James um, from a few years ago. Um, and just to kind of highlight how simple things can be, what you're about to see, I believe, is really the high point of cinema cinematography. Uh, I don't think anyone's done anything as, quite as beautiful as this, but it's very, very simple how they actually did it. So they've got these lanterns, so you'll see there's some lanterns, and all they've done is they've put some 300 watt bulbs in the lanterns, so they've created um, a kind of fake glow inside the lanterns, but then they put a piece of foil and they put proper flames in front. So you see the flicker of what feels like proper flames, but behind it is actually a 300 watt bulb, You'll see some close-up shots, and there's a 650-watt lamp. So if you're a photographer, this might be a little bit new in terms of the kind of description of the lamps and things. But basically, these are just tungsten lamps. So, so um, cheap, 650 watts bounced off a gold reflector. On the train, you'll see there's a huge, what we call a 5K parabolic light. So it's got a very, very harsh beam, but 5K is your household is about 4,000 watts. So 5K, this one light, needs more power than your entire household can run. Okay? So it's a huge light, it's a big light. Um, also, on this train, they've got two special effects rigs. They've got something that creates sparks, and they've got something that creates steam. So they've got a, what we call a gag going on. So someone's created this kind of steam generator and a spark generator. And then on the tracks, there's a, a camera platform that catches, that gets caught by the train as we go along. So you'll see what I mean as, as we go, but that's it, right? And these are what the things look like. So that's the 5K part. It's a big, it's a big lamp. This is the little uh, 650. These are the 300 watt bulbs that go into a lantern. That's it, okay? So this clip is about six minutes long, but it's beautiful. So we'll watch and see. And I'll talk you through it as we go. So you can see here are the lanterns. 
In the background over here, you can see they've got a little catch light just catching these trees to give it some depth. Most likely that's come off those lanterns. There's another one there. So you can see here that there's a light just off camera here through the, uh, through the gold reflector. We push in and there's a slight grumble. He can hear the train. There's the, again, the gold Stop reflector off, off, uh, off camera. Those fools are going to trip and shoot each other in females. I bet you I can find them husbands if they do. <laughs> <coughs> so on this, on this scene you're about to see where he's got his foot, um, literally there are just going to be two guys off camera shaking the thing like this. This is to sh show you the idea of the train coming. We can just there's a slow sort of build up of the sound, which I don't think we're really getting um, in the auditorium here. Okay, so on the train, they literally just have the one light, but look at what this light's able to do. They have some lights underneath, but look at the effect. So you can see there's other lights catching the steam behind. That's the platform, it's being caught. There's a There's the spark gag going on. And that 5K lights up all that steam to give you those amazing silhouettes. So basically, as you can see, there's a whole world that was built up there and you really get immersed in it. But seriously, it's just a bunch of actors. It's just, and there's a guy with a camera and there's a guy with a boom and so on. But that just shows you the power of, of what we're doing and how our job is to immerse people into this world. So we've got a bunch of decisions to make on actually how to achieve this. And in very simple terms, that um, these decisions all add up to embellish the emotion that we're actually trying to get out of the viewer. So, for instance, the first would be camera movement. So, for instance, obviously, handheld camera work is very dynamic. So, if you were shooting private, Saving Private Ryan, it's all handheld because you want it to feel really dynamic and like you're really in a war zone, for example. But a lockdown camera gives it, it's much more thoughtful and, um, you, you know, sort of pondering. Maybe it's more emotional like that. Lighting, so obviously hard light on a face, it's, it's intense, soft for gentleness. But one of the things you'll see a lot of in, in cinematography is that they like to light through things. So if you remember the, when the guys had the masks on and the light was cutting through the trees, this idea of lighting through you know, leaves or windows or so on is actually one of the, the big conceits of, um, of film where you can create this uh, uh, heightened sense of reality using what we might call mottled light in this case. And then obviously lens choice, you know. The, yeah, every, I mean, we're all photographers, right? So we know that the wider lens in close is more intimate, a longer lens further back is a little more detached. So it depends what you're trying to achieve. But it's the combination of all of these things. Now, but there are some typical advertising conceits that we use, for example. And now that I am spell these out, you'll see these in almost every single ad. The first ones are what we call overcranking, and overcranking comes from a term they used to use in the film days, where you speed the film through the gate. So the whole idea is that you're actually shooting at 50 or 100 frames, and you're slowing down the movement to add grace. And this is particularly, I mean, this is used in virtually every TVC that you'll see, but it's very good if you've got bad acting. 
So if you've got people who don't quite know what they're doing, slow it down and it just appears to be quite graceful. Um, and if you think of the way shots work, you'll have a shot for, say, three seconds. And in that three seconds, if you're shooting at 50 frames, that's one and a half seconds of real life. So, so actually, you can get away with a lot by overcranking as well. So it's a great way of covering mistakes. It's a great way of stretching time. Elements in front of the lens. I'm sure you guys have played with this. Old pair of glasses, plastic water bottles, prisms, you know, not so, not so much. Split diopters are really the, the, the trick. So um, I have a whole bunch of split diopters that, that I use for, for this effect. Lens whacking, I'm sure you've tried all that, where you take the lens off the front of the camera as you're shooting. Um, tilt shift and lens baby, less so, less so. Okay, so this is an effect I'm gonna show you a little bit more of in a, in a minute. Uh, lens flares, so, you know, a purist would say, no, no, don't flare the lens, but of course, these days, we love to flare. So, um, most of the really top cinematographers will go out of their way to go and get the old Russian glass, which is, you know, uncoated and so on, because it flares in a very particular way. Uh, and what we would do, for example, like I have a 900 lumens torch, and literally you just put a piece of CTO, like a, a color temperature orange gel on it, and you literally flash it in the lens like that, and it just gives a beautiful sort of effect. Um, one of the things that we do is if you're moving the camera, say, along a dolly, you'll actually set up a, a light, a parabolic light with a very hard light, just a little 200 watt, what we call a pocket part, just to pick up, like, so you, you, you move the camera into the path of that light, and it picks up a flare as it goes through. Um, and then the real trick for us is backlighting and soft bounce to fill. So basically, 99% of what you'll see will be a 2K or a 1.8K HMI or something quite big out from behind, and then literally either a bounce or a Kino flow or a softer light in front, and that, but that's your basic formula. Like, you could almost guarantee that 80% of the stuff is gonna be shot like that. So these are a couple of the advertising sort of tricks that you'll start to see in everything that you watch now. This is a little video by a cinematographer I really admire. He's based in the Philippines, but he has a YouTube channel. Uh, it's called Kinetech, and um, he has all these like how-tos for cinematography. So he actually explores every single one of these in this little tutorial. So we'll just watch this and see what he's got to say. Recently, I shot a testimonial commercial that the director wanted to look more like a beauty commercial. I have been shooting beauty for many years, so I took a few techniques and applied them to this shot, which was originally conceptualized as a basic testimonial. I lit the main subject with only one light. It was a backlight or separator. I used a 1K parabolic hanging directly above and behind her, but any Fresnel or parabolic lamp head would have a similar effect. Then I placed two reflectors either side to bounce the light of the parabolic back at the subject. This makes for a very soft light with few shadows. I used bleach canvas rags from the Kinetech Dop Kit, but two polystyrene boards would be the most common way to achieve this type of soft bounce. Because the bounce light was such a large area, it reflected in the talent's eyes, creating quite an obvious eye light. I find eye light very important in classic beauty shots. Without it, eyes look dark and non-expressive. As it was a testimonial, had we wanted direct contact with the audience, we frame the talent at center. Rule of thirds looks beautiful, but is less effective when trying to capture an audience's attention. Center framing and symmetry will work better. This is a traveling flare at the top of the frame. It was not from the subject light. It was from lights set up near the camera, specifically placed to flare into the camera. This is called flashing. It lowers the contrast of the image organically without having to use filters or grading. I pointed three small 50 watt Kinelux directly at camera. They were mounted on the Catrax configuration of the Kinetrax dolly, but this could also be set up with a slider. I placed finger flags in front of the lights to make the flare intermittent. When the lights were dollied, the flare appeared to get flashed quite naturally. 
I also placed a soft focus vignette around the subject. This could be done in post, but I find if shot live, it looks much more organic and aesthetically pleasing. To achieve the vignette, I place three glass objects in front of the lens. Any glass objects will do. Regular drinking glasses work very well for this. I wanted this vignette to be dynamic and not static, so I rigged it to be rotated as we shot. It comes out as a vignette made of soft focus, refraction and bokeh. Then, to put parallax into the shot to help generate depth perception, I creep dollied the camera. The techniques appear very subtle on the frame, but the shot would have looked very different without them. I hope this film will be useful to you. Interesting, huh? So, uh, so yeah, that's basically all the tricks in one, in one place. Um, that's not hard to do, actually, because if you've got the right crew, the gaffers will have all that gear in the truck, and they'll set it up for you. So it looks like a headache, but it's, it's their problem, not yours. So um, here's an example of a guy who, this guy is absolutely fantastic. His name is Bruno Avion. He actually does a lot of stills, fashion work. He was an art director in an ad agency before he made his name. Does a lot of high-end uh, beauty stuff. And this film uses all of the tricks with the split diopters and the stuff in front of the lens and so on. Everything is, you'll see the, the, the familiar themes here. Everything's backlit. Everything's using these split diopters and flares. So we'll have a look at this. <coughs> Lots and lots of cuts in this film as well. And if you saw each of these shots independently, you might think, eh, it's okay, it's not great, but the, it's the effect of them all together. So you can see in a lot of these shots, they'll have basically a, a, a lens, another lens, in front of the lens, like in this, for example. And it's either tilted or it's so thick that it creates a completely different focal length and focus for, the, for, the, um, for that area. So it gives this nice kind of out of whack sort of look. get the idea. So, th so that was for Louis Vuitton. His, um, his rate, I believe, is about a million dirham per film. It's actually pretty decent. So uh, this is what we aspire to. OK, so, um, but we're not in that world. We're in a completely different world. So what I wanted to do was to give you a bit of a walkthrough of the advertising process and the creativity and so on. and. It all starts with the truth that people watch what interests them, and sometimes it's an ad. And sometimes we forget this because people immediately think, oh, it's an ad, no one's interested, they just skip through. But if you do your job properly and it's interesting enough, people will stick around and actually watch it. What interests them? Of course, uniqueness, impact, and insight. Now, uniqueness is all about being fresh and being a little surprising. And this is the kind of holy grail for us is, you know, the idea of being surprising and fresh is, uh, it's really hard because everything has kind of been done, you know. And uh, one of the problems that we face is that as filmmakers, when you're looking for references, we automatically look for other films. And this is where it's very hard to be fresh and surprising because if you're talking about, oh, there was a Martin Scorsese film and th they did it like this, well, it's not fresh and surprising because he did it. You know? So the whole thing is you have to look outside your comfort zone. 
So you have to look at stills, you have to look at music videos, you have to, you know, it could be experimental art or performance art. I mean, the, the, the sculpture, I mean, there's so many different uh, um, ways that you can approach it. But the idea is you don't look at other things that are directly the same as what you're trying to do. And this is a kind of 101 error that a lot of young advertising creatives do. They just look, they look at other ads. Impact. So funny or emotional. It's, a, it's basically funny or emotional. If you, if you want to create the two, the, the two categories, most ads are either in one or the other, or they've got relevance and information behind them. And there's a cool insight. And insight is actually where we're going to begin, because insight is the kind of heart and soul of really good work. No matter what work you do, um, insight is everything. At the end of the day, they don't care about your creativity. They just want sales. And sometimes as a creative person, we really forget this because we want to get out there and do all these tricks and come up with a really cool piece of film. And if I hadn't told you that that was a Louis Vuitton film, would you have known? You know? So yeah, so it's like, well, did Louis Vuitton just waste a million dirham on him? You could argue that they did, right? Like, you, you know, this is, this is the argument that happens all the time in our, in our industry. Because they're not buying the drill, they're buying the hole. And this is the old sales analogy that we, we use. So they don't want the drill, they don't want the creativity, they want the result. Okay, so we should be redefining creativity as ideas that are engaging, but also deliver a clear brand message, okay? So I'm kind of delving into the world advertising here a little bit to kind of give you the foundation of how we move forward. Now, within organizations, you have two guys, like for instance, I do a lot of work with, uh, say, Unilever, for example. They have a whole department of media buyers, and those guys are judged on what they call engagement. Brand managers are judged on recall. These are two very different things. So engagement is how immersed that viewer was in the work. Recall is whether they can tell you about the product and you know, what it was offering and what the point of the communication was. Now, for us as consumers, too much brand just really turns us off. If you're on Facebook and you see an ad and immediately you know it's just an ad for a car or washing powder or whatever, you've just gone, you've flicked straight past it. On the other hand, as we've just noticed, not enough brand is actually a waste of money. There's not enough recall. So this is the, this is the kind of world that we live in as commercial filmmakers, is we have to bridge both of those things. Okay? Now, the most effective communication in how we work is single-minded. It's one simple idea. That's it. So often the clients will say, hey, we want to show that it's the bigger pack and we want to show that even kids can use it. Oh, and we need to also show that, you know, it's for night and day. And then we, and it's, whoa, 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 hang on. You know, suddenly they've got 20 things they want to say. You need one thing well told. And it needs to have an insight that gets you as if you're going, ah, oh, okay, I get it, I get it, like this. So as we said, insights. Now I'm going to share plenty of examples of how we arrive at all these. Insight, single-minded proposition, and that all tips into what we call the big idea. Okay, so we're going to see plenty of these now. Now, this example I'm about to share with you is a very funny um, piece from Saatchi and Saatchi in New York. The insight was that even a small coffee stain calls attention to itself. So we've all worn a white shirt, or you know, especially with Kanduras, you know, you get one tiny little dot on there and it just bugs you all day, and you think everyone's looking at it. Now, the single-minded proposition is that stains are so distracting that they actually compete for other people's attention. And then you would brainstorm that, and you would kind of go, OK, well, what's the worst situation you know, that we can think of where you'd have a stain on your shirt? And you'd brainstorm that and kind of work out, well, would it be a wedding, or is it like a date, or, ah, maybe it's a job interview. Then. When do we really need people to focus on what we're saying? Because this is all about distraction, right? So then you'd be thinking, oh, it's got to be, maybe it's a job interview because you want the guy, to, you want to sell yourself and you want everyone to believe that you're right for the job and so on. So the big idea is talking stain. Okay. Well, you know, an organized person, somebody who does not need details. I'm actually very, very good with groups. Mm -hmm. 
I've surpassed all my goals, my previous position, my prior job, and your competitor. My personnel and me have surpassed their own goals. Simple, huh? Get famous at mytalkingsting.com. Okay. We're going to watch this again because I think the beauty of this, the beauty of this spot comes in this two things. It's beautifully cast. Like this guy is great because he's this hapless, very likable guy. You know, so if you're casting a film like this, if he's too handsome, then you, you don't really relate to him. You want a guy, you, the underdog guy, you can kind of get behind. You know? So the casting was really important for this. But more importantly, it's the guy's eye line. It's the interviewer's eye line that's kind of funny. And he does that little flare with his eye that's, that's really, really funny. So it's very nuanced, right? So we'll look at it again, and we'll, and we'll see what, the, what they were doing. And just watch the direction now. So we establish. Well, you know, an organized person, somebody who does not need details. Out. I'm actually very, very good with groups. Closer. Mm -hmm. I've surpassed all my goals, my previous position, my prior job, and your competitor. That, that's the eye line there. That's the tilt of the head. That's yeah. their own goals. So there you go. So, the, so there's actually a lot of nuance to get that right as a, as a piece of communication. So the idea is really funny, but the execution is, is, is great. And it was beautifully cast. But look, it's two guys in a room. I mean, it doesn't get easier than that, does it? So, but again, they had a great idea. And I mean, anyone, any 15-year-old kid can do that on After Effects these days, too, the, the, the idea of the talking stain. OK, now, in the old days of TV, you used to have these 30-second spots. We still do. It's still a relic of those times. There was 22 seconds of story and 8 seconds of sell. And the whole idea was that the brand would entertain you for that period of time. And you'd accept that because it's kind of cool and funny and all that. But then they get to the point and they sell whatever it is that they're going to sell to you. So there was a kind of a transaction that sort of happened when you were watching an ad. But today, of course, Social media has changed this altogether because just no one cares anymore. If you detect it's an ad, you're straight off the thing. So, so this idea of having the 22 seconds of fun and games now is no longer relevant unless it's something comp really, really fascinating, which we'll get to. Engagement on Facebook is less than three seconds. So if you're trying to, if you want to promote a business or an idea and you take a sponsored ad on Facebook, Good luck, because it's three seconds. And um, uh, viewers aren't even stopping scrolling these days. So, um, so imagine, so everyone's in a dilemma. How do we produce work that gets in front of viewers in the right way? Because you've got three seconds. As I said, unless there's something that's really clever about it. This one of my favorite, favorite ads of all time. You don't have to um, uh, come from India to get this. India really have an amazing. Um, depth when it comes to uh, comedy. So we'll watch this and see. But the reason why I'm showing this to you is because it sucks you in. So you're in. It's an ad. It sucks you in. आप समझ नहीं रहे मेरी बात को आप क्यों ऐसा लग रहा है कि मैंने कुरियर नहीं किया सर संडे को मैं कहां जाऊंगा आप बताइए मुझे सर संडे को कौन सा कुरियर वाला खुला रहता है सर आप बताइए मुझे सर मैं अपने आप को आपकी जगह रखकर देख रहा हूं लेकिन सर <laughs> Genius, huh? 
So if you look at it, it's one room, like it's five actors, six actors, you know, it's all just shot in a day, very, very simple. But we're going to, we'll watch it again, right? Because I think it's really worth looking at the techniques that they used, right? So let, let's have a look. So we're establishing it's a household, it's, you know, maybe a Saturday morning or something, kids are clowning around, and there's no music. Okay, now the music starts. We know something's wrong. So it's very clever in terms of sound design. And it's that music which kind of great. So you know, uh-oh, there's a problem. We understand the gas is on. And we see it from his point of view, but he can't communicate with anyone. So what you see through the ad, everything gets closer and closer and closer as well. So it's his point of view. So we keep coming back to him. And just watch everything starts to creep in closer and closer. Closer on the kid. Closer on the guy with the lighter. Closer on her with the, with the matches. Closer on his face. Again, closer, closer again, closer again. Music's become much more intense. Closer, closer. There you go. So, so it's that you can see the build up, and the build up was very cleverly done by the way that we've evolved it from shot to shot. We get closer, 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 closer to the action. Okay, so that ad's intriguing enough to hold our attention because we're in the we're in the moment. We don't they're not selling us anything at that point, and it's at the end where you're like, oh, okay, tension, get it. But this is the viewer brand transaction that we're talking about. So there's a payoff, right? Okay, so there are three basic approaches as we are talking about before. There's the emotional approach, the kind of entertaining approach, and then the educational approach. And I wanted to share with you three different ads that really sum up each of these beautifully. And again, all of these are very, very simple that we could do these without too much, um, too much effort. They're not big budget spots. This is um, now... This needs a bit of preamble because seatbelt safety is a big problem in every society. And the traditional approach to seatbelt safety was always to show car accidents and to show death and all this kind of thing, to scare people to wear the seatbelt. But it's also known that these don't work. Like people become very numb to them and they kind of zone out. So seatbelt safety is, was always a very, very hard brief to crack, to write to, because you, know, you don't want to just show car accidents and things like this. So this is how they tackled it in a UK spot just recently. Slowed down camera. Beautiful, huh? Three people in a room. And there was one effect shot in that. That's it. But obviously the emotional idea is that you're a family, you know? So they've really tapped into that very beautifully. So th this is where your ideas have to really stem from, are these truths, you know? That somehow we know that if someone in our family dies in a car accident, it's a terrible loss. 
So to involve the whole family in that way is actually very powerful. Okay, educational. I throw this one in. This comes up on my YouTube feed all the time. And it, it was driving me crazy. But then I, I watched it once and I thought it's actually very, very clever because this is an educational approach. And what you'll see here is they're telling you all about the product all the way through the ad. Just watch and see. I am... That's so stupid. Mm. Okay, I'm honored Jake made the mistake of letting me speak at his wedding. Okay. Did Jake realize? That's when little Jake realized he had made his ghost costume out of his mother's wedding dress. Jake had a few relationship disasters. Uh, Jake had a series of relationship mishaps. Jake became convinced that his love life had been cursed. That's still great. That dress had cursed his love life. So, if you are single and superstitious, maybe you should try cutting some holes in your mom's wedding dress. <laughs> because Jake told me himself that he feels like the luckiest guy in the world to have met Eva. That's just pure education. The whole ad was just telling you how the product worked. But it sucks you in because it's a story. So again, it's stories, you know. So I think beneath all this, we have to keep in mind that what we're really doing uh, in the commercial world for clients is that we're trying to create and build stories that create these worlds that are immersive and that our audiences can get kind of absorbed in. This is absolutely hilarious. One of my favorite funny spots of all time. Has everyone seen Castaway? Do you remember Castaway with Tom Hanks? He's on a desert island. He's there for years and years. And if you remember the gag, there was this one thing where there's a FedEx parcel there, and he doesn't open it because it's his way of somehow having hope that when he gets back, he knows he's one day he's going to get back, he's going to give that parcel. If you remember, that's set up in the, um, um, in the film. Okay, so here's, so FedEx uh, notorious for kind of capitalizing on all these really sort of funny moments. So let's see what they did. Hi. Hi. I've been ruined on an island for five years with this package. And I swore that I would deliver it to you because I work for FedEx. That's... Very admirable. Thank you. Hey, well, by the way, what's in the package? Uh, nothing really. Just a satellite phone, GPS locator, fishing rod, water purifier, and some seeds. Just silly stuff. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> you keep up the good work. So that's, uh, that's the entertainment value that you kind of look for in that too. Now, if you saw that, of course you're going to share that, you know, especially if it, this is just a few months after this movie's come out. Of course you're going to share stuff like that. So this all becomes quite shareable. You might argue that the, the, the other ad, the Grammarly ad, you probably wouldn't share that, but it does the job. But the seatbelt ad, you might even share that because it's so touching. So this is where, as we said, the humor and the emotional side um, are the strongest kind of platforms to work from. The other thing that I've noticed is that if you go the humorous route, a lot of people flame you online. So this happens to a lot of brands where they try to be funny and it doesn't quite work, and then they just get hell on, on, you know, in the comments uh, on Instagram or whatever. So I find that the emotional routes are a little bit easier. So if you want to, if you're torn between the two, go the emotional route because. Uh, no one's going to tear shreds uh, off you for, for an emotional film. But they will if it's a bad comedy. OK, so your battery is running low. Oh, OK. Um, do we have a tech guy? Sorry, it doesn't, it's not um, plugged in, I think. <coughs> it's, I don't think it's plugged in. Oh, there you go. Oh, OK, awesome. Better? OK. 
So we were talking about cheap films. I just wanted to share with you the world's most expensive ad. And this is $33 million. God knows where it went. Like, uh, um, it's, it's amazing that they even did this. But it's for Chanel. And it features this directed by Baz Luhrmann, who you probably know, director who did Romeo and Juliet and so on. Um, Nicole Ki Kidman is in it. We'll watch the whole lot because you need to see where $33 million went to. Okay? It's beautifully done, by the way. <clears throat> when did I wake? Oh, no sound. I must have been the only person in the world who didn't know who she was. The world's most famous Her smile. Her perfume. There you go. <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, so $33 million. I, I wanted to share that because this is not our, our world at all. Like, uh, um, I <laughs> we're here because we need to be producing a great content or great commercials, actually on low budgets. And so most of the time you'll see that you can achieve with a low budget anything that you can do on a higher budget, as long as you're clever. Bigger does not mean better. And I'll show you two examples. This first film here was a film shot for Etihad as part of their um, global, what we call thematic campaign, when they were introducing their new kind of brand idea. And the whole idea is it's a split screen thing, and we're seeing these kind of different realities kind of merging together. So the whole idea is that, you know, the world is this big place, and here are these something happening in Africa and something happening in New York, and somehow we can bring it all together, you know. So that's the kind of the basic concept behind it. So let's have a look. It's beautifully done. You've got to remember with films like this that every single moment in these films has been created for the film. They've had to cast every single actor. They've cast every single actor. They've thought about and planned every single moment. beautiful things. The world abounds with many delights, magical sights. Fanciful flights and those who dream on beautiful nights dream of beautiful things. Beautiful days for sunshine, days and beautiful skies and shores. Beautiful days when I can gaze in beautiful people. Okay, so that was a $2 million film there. And as I said, every single shot was crafted, planned, cast, you know, art directed, and so on. Um, this film is the exact opposite. 
It's a fella who was sent off with a line producer in each, or a fixer in each location. He spent five days in each place and basically put together a film. This actually predates the Etihad film by quite a long way, actually. So let's, let's check it out. So it's basically one kind of directed DP guy with a 5D. You'll see lots of time lapses in this. <clears throat> the music is just premiumbeat.com or Audio Jungle, one of those things. Shot at the end. <clears throat> okay, so they kind of serve the same purpose as you can see. The Etihad film was two million, the other one was twenty-five thousand. So just to put it in perspective, so that was kind of my estimate. Thinking, okay, his day raid, he's five days in each place, a little bit of prep, and so on. So um, now. This brings us to the law of diminishing returns because additional time, effort, and money does not yield exponentially better results. There kind of comes a point where you can keep spending, but nothing gets better. Right? Now, at the end of all this, as we said before, it's all about the idea. So um, the main problem that I think we face, especially when you're first getting into filmmaking, is that because you tend to just be able to get whatever work you can, you're probably going to be working with clients and agencies who are not really idea focused. Uh, for instance, what I'm noticing is a lot of more of the social media agencies and so on, which have become really popular these days, or digital agencies, they're not really schooled in the big idea. Like it's not something that they're kind of familiar with. Like they'll have a theme that they'll work to, but they don't really come up with these big, beautiful ideas. So when you work with directly with an agency, they'll give you the idea, and they'll give you even their own storyboard. But when you're working with the smaller agencies, uh, like these social media or digital agencies, or with clients direct, often it's on you to come up with an idea. So this is a, a very cool spot. Um, it's an old one. I wanted to share it because it's the simplest film you'll ever see in your life. It's literally an orange curtain, a piece of like a huge poly piece of foam, um, and it's made out to look like a, pho a photo booth. So if you imagine that we could just get in a corner here and we could set this up in a corner, you know, it's, that, it's like that. The lighting, there's nothing special about the lighting. What they've done in this ad is that they've cast this guy he, this is masterful casting with this guy, as you'll see. But the other thing is it's one continuous shot, okay? So what you need to keep in mind is that this has been done probably 15 or 20 times, take after take, and what they've worked out is the timing points for each of the things. So there'll be a guy, the director or the first AD, in, in one instance, over the shoulder of the cameraman going, three, two, one, okay, look down, okay? Right. 
three, two, one, look back up. Like there's a whole, there's a guy off the screen telling him what to do, okay? And then after he's got the timing, then they'll get it to hand gestures. And then he just knows, he can just see in the corner of his eye what's happening and then he gets his timing. Because you've got to get it exactly spot on 30 seconds. Okay, so I don't know what's happening with our projector, but we'll persevere. Is a cigar called Happiness Hamlet. is a cigar called Hamlet. Now, the interesting, these ads were famous because, so the idea, the insight was, look, if everything else has gone bad in your life, it's okay, you can sit there and have your Hamlet cigar. This was the thinking, right? Um, but what they, they're not allowed to show the actual smoking moment on screen. So that's why it was actually underneath. So it's actually a little bit cunning as well. Um, do you think we can have a, a bit of volume on the... Um, Presentation, please, if our, our Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so now, the world yesterday, as we said, the big thematic TVCs with all the supporting outdoor and press ads. Do you remember press ads? Does anyone ever read a newspaper today? Maybe on, maybe on your phone, but that's it. Typically, a thematic film would be in excess of a quarter of a million dollars US. Like, that would be a fairly standard, like, that we would see come across the table was a small one, okay, 250,000. But these are taken very, very seriously because what happens is they're very, um, it's the brand presenting itself to the world. So marketers and agencies are fired and hired based on this kind of work. And so what happens is that that's why everyone's got their hands on every element when, when you're involved in a project like this. I'm going to show you a film which has the dubious honor of it won tons of awards, this thing. It's from Dubai, but the marketing, I heard the story I've heard, correct, I don't know if it's 100% correct, it's all hearsay, but the story I heard was that the marketing director that commissioned the ad was fired because of the ad, right? But then it won gold in every single award there was, and then his replacement got a promotion for the same ad, right? So that just goes to show how crazy everything is. So I'll share with you the ad. It's a little long, so, um, but I think the point here goes down to is it engaging and what is it for? Okay, let's check it out.
Okay. So you can see why someone's gone, you're fired, get out. Because <laughs> right? the first thing is, like, uh, you could argue for the brand, well, they're fighting, these characters are fighting, this is not what, you know, because we want happy people and so on and so on. But also, it's sort of a bit like, but what has this got to do with uh, Snickers? And is it on what the brand is trying to actually put into the market or, or, or talk about? So, um, uh, so that's a kind of a weird example where the money got a bit out of control as well. So that's the old category, right? The thinking nowadays is why are we spending so much money on a single spot when we can have 40 of them? you know, for example, but do them for online. And uh, I was a creative director with um, uh, Pepsi for a little while. And uh, we spent quite a lot of money over the uh, course of the um, FIFA, the last FIFA. And then it sort of became apparent like, well, you know, why are we doing these huge spots? We can spend, we can spend that same money and we can do tons more work. So online films have become the kind of new thing, you know. Um, they're, they're often the main element in a brand campaign today. So a lot of brands aren't even doing TV anymore. They're going straight into online. Um, and there are plenty of calendar opportunities. And this is kind of where social media really kind of stands out because you can communicate with your audience multiple times in a year. So if you're, uh, you could be, it could be back to school, could be Ramadan, could be, you know, there's uh, end of year, there could be Christmas, there could be Eid, there, I mean, you pick it, they've got a calendar where they've actually worked out what they're going to talk about at each point through the year. So these days, YouTube is the king because basically you've got this whole skip ad thing, but you've got to watch what's going on, and it's keyword centric. So if someone's looking for cooking recipes, you're probably not going to get a Chevrolet ad, you'll get the Maggie ad, you know. So it's like that, so it's targeted. So this, is, uh, so th this has become the kind of mainstay at the moment of sort of digital media. And as we mentioned before, Facebook and Instagram and so on have kind of come off the boil a little bit because of the, um, the problems that we were talking about before with engagement. The main thing is that even though they're lower budgets, they still want cinematic values. And that's where things get a little bit, how do you say, difficult because cinematic values have a price tag attached to them, you know, to, to a, arrive at that quality level. But not necessarily. So I'm going to share with you a spot here and break it down. And then after we've broken it down, we'll, we'll, we'll break for a little bit. This is a spot that I shot for Ema. And we shot it with two stills. So what, what you're going to see here are two stills that weren't even stills, they were architectural renders. So they're not even perfect perspective. They're a little bit wonky, the perspective. Um, so we use those two stills to create this world that this woman in, inhabits. And, she, and this is for their opera district um, development. So I'll show you the spot and we'll break it down. There's one still. Is the other. Okay, so um, so it looks like she's actually living the high life, but the thing wasn't even built. So how we did it was we shot a green screen in a studio using the two supplied stills, which we animated. So what we did was the guys actually lifted some um, imagery showing the fountain, and then they reworked it into our, um, our, our film. Um, and the breakdown of the whole thing is that the total production for that would have been around $30,000, because we had the model, the dress, and hair, makeup. Then we had a prop master and the props, which were basically the, um, the, the little um, eyepiece and so on, and the jewelry. Studio lighting and catering, never forget catering. Uh, crew, gaffer, spark, camera assistants. There's quite a lot of people on set, actually. The compositing and, a and animation happened later. And then there was one royalty-free track, which took days and days and days of searching to find. So 
So basically what we did was we had this still and we shot our model in each of these green screens. So the, the process we used was that when we analyzed the still, we thought, all right, it looks like it's probably a 28 mil or a 21 mil. I can't remember now. It's up a little, it's a little bit elevated looking down. And that, so we set up our camera position to kind of copy the perspective of the still, which was, as I said, an architectural. It wasn't even a proper still. So far, you can even see all the angles are really wonky, you know. Um, so we, we then worked out, we, we, we marked out her spots to walk and stop. Uh, and she was all shot green screen. So she would walk in and stop at that particular mark. And what we did is that anyone who shot green screen, and I'm sure you guys are doing a lot of compositing work anyway, um, it's just a hell of a time getting it right because you get any green spill and it's very, very hard to remove. And actually skin tones, um, skin tones have a little tiny bit of green in them anyway. You know, So if you get green spill, it's very hard to manage. So what we did is we had our compositor on set with his laptop. And every time we would shoot, we would then take it, trans, transcode it. We shot red raw on this one. Um, and then we would actually do the key and see if it keyed OK. So the keying is where you remove the green. So we did this maybe five, six times before we got this one correct. This was our first shot. And then once we kind of knew what our intensity levels were for everything based on that particular setup, then the rest of it was kind of relatively easy. Um, so, so she's on a green screen, she walks in and she stands there. In this shot, all we've done is we've created the bokeh, it's all fake. Um, it's, that's just a totally fictitious created sort of a background. Um, but you can see lighting wise, what we've done is we've got a nice soft big backlight on her to kind of chisel her out to make her easy to, uh, to key out. And I had a tiny little bit of magenta on it. So the idea was that it was the opposite color, so that if we got any spill, um, we kind of had the reverse effect on, on her. Then we had a, what we call a gem ball, which is basically a big china light just in, in front of her, which gives this beautiful, soft, kind of very uh, sort of feminine sort of lighting. Um, and that was it. And there was a poly, like a, a poly underneath. You can, I think you can see in the eyes there, we've just got the gem ball uh, above. Okay, so. Similarly here. So these two were at the same setup, but they represented different parts of the storyboard. Uh, the table was just a table that we had in the studio, and this was the, the prop that we spent days and days looking for. This was the other still. So again, we fix the angle, we work out the angle, and we just get her to walk in and hit the mark and hold the thing up like that. This close-up was basically a, a blow-up of that um, and then, as we said, this one was a totally fictitious um, background that was just created out of nothing. So, uh, so as you can see from two stills, um, it was okay. It was just a day in the studio. But as you can see, there was a lot of a lot behind it because we had quite a big crew to get the lighting right and um, um, uh, with camera and so on. And matching was was quite tricky. Okay, so this is just a rundown. I think I've been through all that. I used the 85 for the close-ups, the 35 over the shoulder, and the 21 for the wide stuff. And it was all shot at 50p. But what happens is when you shoot green screen, you've got to be extremely careful not to get any motion blur. So if you ever shoot green screen and you slow it down, you have to slightly overcompensate on the shutter speed. So you normally go double the frame rate, just a little bit more just to help you. You don't want any motion blur. We had the VFX guy on set, as I mentioned. And when you do green screen, you have to shoot at a very deep bit rate, like the color. You have to have 16-bit um, raw or at least 444. Four. You can't shoot just with standard video. It's, you're not going to get the, um, the effect you want. It's not going to uh, key cleanly. The, um, the, the animations were all, uh, were all just created. And we put mirror reflections on the windows as well. There was a lot of art, actually, in the compositing. So we created these mirror reflections just with blended, um, blended layers. And um, everything was kind of faked. 
So all we did in the grade was we channeled everything into these warm skin tones so that you just got this golden black kind of a look. Uh, and we desaturated everything else. So basically, it, 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 the reference for this was a Chanel ad, which was just black and gold. So, so that's, that's what we did there. Now, I think it's a good time for us to take a break, have a coffee, relax uh, for, for 10, 15 minutes. Plenty more to come. Uh, we're going to be doing more breakdowns and looking at a lot more ads and so on. Um, so we'll take a break now, and we'll come back in 15 minutes? 15 minutes, okay.
Yes? Oh, yeah, there's something. Okay, cool. Okay, how are we going, guys? Everyone's all right? Had a stretch? Okay, so, so we'll just slightly summarize a little bit of, of where we've been. As you know, we were just talking about how to create um, films for commercial films for clients and agencies um, at low cost. So uh, definitely the rest of this presentation is all about how do we keep everything manageable and, um, and how to do cool work actually too. And as we said, it's all based on the idea. It all begins with the idea. And then after your idea, you then have to work out what that execution is. Okay, so, um, and this is where if you're a good filmmaker, you've got a bit of a technical head. So often what happens, like, like a director won't know too much of the technical side, but I would challenge that in this day and age, a director who shoots, being technical is, is a very, very good advantage to have. And, I'll, and that segues very nicely into the next slide. Okay, this film, are we sw switched on for sound and everything? Okay, this film is, um, an old Saatchi and Saatchi film from the 80s. It goes back a long, long way. Um, my managing director, I was at Saatchi and Saatchi uh, back in the day, and the managing director said, quote, unquote, this would bring a tear to a glass eye. It's a very, very moving film, and it's very simple in the execution, but just check how impactful this is. Okay, you ready? It's not time to make a change Just relax, take it easy You're still young, that's your fault There's so much you have to know Find a girl, settle down If you want, you can marry Look at me, I am old, but I'm happy once like you are now And I know that it's not easy To be calm When you found something going on but Take your time Think a lot I think of everything you've got For you will still be here tomorrow But your dreams may not So it's very moving. The music does a lot of the heavy lifting in this one. But I'm going to break it down. Okay, so what we've got, I've broken down each individual shot so you can kind of see how this all stitches together. This shot at the end is basically your shot that shows the whole house. And the reality that they're trying to build here is that it's a seaside town and there's a father and son and they're growing up together. So you can see the elements. We've got this kind of cute little seaside house. We've got the boats. There's a barbecue and some bits and bobs around there. Now, technically, so let's jump out of the, the film and the world that it created. Technically, this was a one-day shoot. It involved a whole bunch of different actors as the father, a whole bunch of different actors as the child. But we come to believe them as the same person. But actually, when you see the stills, they're completely different. So we've got this fella. He looks pretty cool. And this one's a different guy, but he kind of looks like him. He's the same. But this guy, well, hang on, hang on. Are they that? No, you know. So you can see, right? We've got different actors. But it's beautifully cast. And obviously, hair and makeup has been done in a way where they've tried to match these up to make everyone look um, similar. There are certain elements that appear in the, in the film. So we've got an old car. And then the old car disappears. There's a, a slightly newer car in this one, for example. So prop, the props guys have got a bunch of old cars. They've gone, right, we need an old 60s Holden in this one. And this one, we need a 70s Holden in this one. Okay, And then that's what they've done. Um, the Props-wise, we've also gone from the barbecue to fishing to rowing to surfing. 
And these things represent what the kid would do growing up as well, you know, like a six-year-old kid might not be surfing, for example. So, um, so the whole idea is they've kept a kind of a, a internal logic as to what they've done with in each frame, okay? But basically, they've built a different reality for each shot. So we've got the original one, which is obviously late 60s. Then we're in the early 70s. And you can see from the grading, you can even see what they've done here. So you can see there's a kind of a Kodachrome look, like kind of Polaroid-ish, sort of washed out sort of a look. It looks like it's come straight from a photo album. And the whole idea is they've changed the look. This has got more magenta. This has got more blue. This is, you know, more desaturated. Again, more yellow, but desaturated. And then, you know, again, the look changes from shot to shot to give you the feeling that these are like little handy cam shots through the years, okay? But it's all just shot on the one camera, but this is all done in post. So they've created this reality where you've got all these different actors with the kids and so on and they're different props, and then it all amounted to that film. So it's actually very, very clever. So again, it goes back to that idea that we're building worlds here, you know? and that we've shown the passing of the time really beautifully, and when it froze into black and white, we, we get the idea. Okay. So, as you can see, on a shoot like that, you need seven sons, five fathers, three cars, two boats, barbecue, life jacket, all this sort of thing, various wardrobe changes, um, and then the Cat Stevens song, that would have cost an absolute arm and a leg, for sure. Like I. I'm just guessing at $50,000, but I think it'd be more than that. Um, so the rest of it's actually fairly straightforward, but you can see how they've created this world. Okay. Now, when we get our brief, so you, someone's given you a brief, we want to make a film, but we have no money, or we have, we, we have no talent, or we have no, there's something missing or whatever. What, there's a weakness in the brief. Okay. There's this, old saying that you make the weakness in your brief the creative jumping off point. And this is something that is so, so, so true. So, because often you think, oh, they've got, there's no talent. We have to just use the people from the client's office or we have to, whatever the problem is, right? But there's no location, for example. There's no, there's always a weak something or other, right, to your brief. That becomes your creative jumping off point. So no talent or location, for example. Write some great copy based on a solid insight. So for instance, if you get commissioned to make a film um, for, let's say, Nike, and they've said, look, we're going to give you a go. You seem like a nice guy, but there's no budget for anything. Off you go. What are you going to do? So in this instance, well, what you would do is you would get a great copywriter, someone who's got beautiful copy craft, get them to write a very beautiful thematic piece of copy, and then you just get a wheelchair out, <laughs> sit in the wheelchair with a camera, and we could do it in the back of a car, like uh, pop the back of your car rope and sit in the back of the car, and watch what happens next. I'm sure you've seen this film before. Greatness, it's just something we made up. Somehow we've come to believe that greatness is a gift reserved for a chosen few, for prodigies, for superstars. And the rest of us can only stand by watching. You can forget that. Greatness is not some rare DNA strand. It's not some precious thing. Greatness is no more unique to us than breathing. We're all capable of it. All of us. So that, that film got millions and millions of views online organically because people could relate to it, you know. The whole insight being that greatness is not like something you see Michael Jordan or Ronaldo or whatever doing. Greatness is something that we, 
it's just made up, but somehow you can imbibe it yourself. So there was a whole campaign based around this, but what a great insight. But as you can see, executionally, it's literally they've just got a car with the boot open, the guy's sitting in there with a the camera on a tripod, and it's just rolling a little bit, and the guy's running towards the camera. It's all done in one take, very, very simple. Oh, and it was shot at sunrise or sunset, which obviously is the best time of day to shoot, as we all know. So, okay, no budget for talent or crew. Why don't you be the talent? So this is actually, this guy's such a cool director. His name's Casey Neistat. You may have heard of him. Um, I just think this guy is really awesome. But, but the problem is it's always about him. But this was the first time that he did this. And I thought it was super clever. So check, check out what he did. So basically, again, Nike have said, hey, we're going to give you some money. Not much money. We're going to give you some money. Um, go and make a film about um, um, you know, whatever their latest sort of thing was. Let's check it out. <clears throat> Already you get the idea it's quite rebellious sort of a, a fella. Definitely make this flight, but we're cutting it close. So far the trip is off to a fairly irresponsible start. And so it begins. We got to Paris, 17 degrees outside. The airport, it's in effect. Welcome to Cairo. This, this film was shot with a little Canon C130, little tiny little pocket camera, and um, that's all he used. All in all, very successful. We visited Tahir Square, we rode horses, and Max almost fell off of his. <laughs> And what he's done is he's come up with a couple of visual gags that he could repeat in each place. So you'll see the running across the frame, holding the camera out in front of him and so on, that he knew that he could use in the edit, like that. So one thing he's very good at is kind of breaking up the action a lot. So it's not just in your face the whole time. Like the food thing, he pauses. There's another moment where everything kind of pauses. So he's kind of broken the film up quite a lot, which is which was very clever. Otherwise, it's just a little bit too much and a little bit too in your face all the time. And I mean, check the quality out, right? They've obviously blown this up out of nothing. But it didn't matter. Music's all gone down. Again, changing gears, you know.
Right. So there you go. So like, uh, so what a clever idea. He's taken the client's budget to spend it on himself and his mate traveling around, but it hit the client's objective. And I believe it's had something like 40, 50 million uh, views online. So it's a really, really popular film. So no budget for production values. I think we've all been there. This is where insights have to really come into play. Now, the thing about insights is that which leads us to how you work with your ideas. So I mentioned previously that one of the problems that, say, photographers or filmmakers or even musicians have, if you play guitar, then all your references are guitar players. So you're just going to sound like another guitar player. But if your reference was a sax player, for example, would that change the way you played your instrument? You know, what notes you selected and so on? Quite likely. So the whole idea is that as a filmmaker, you don't want to be looking at other films for, you want to be inspired by them, but you don't want to use them as your kind of creative uh, inspiration to base your ideas from. So for instance, a lot of filmmakers will have like a P Pinterest pages, for example. So um, you just have dozens and dozens and dozens of photos on your Pinterest page. Anything you see that's even remotely interesting, just keep it, store it. And then when you're trying to work out what sort of ideas you want to do, you can just scroll back through it and see if there was anything in there that might trigger kind of a nice idea. So Pinterest is really cool. Um, reading, you know, like I think the best creatives tend to be really well read. So for example, um, the ad you're about to see is based on an insight the copywriter got from a book called Emotional Intelligence. And in the book, there was a research study that they did, which I'm not going to go into now because it'll spoil the film. But the whole idea was he went, oh, this research study, which was really kind of prominent in this book, would be awesome for this film. So, and that's what he did. So, so when you're trying to reach for your own ideas, try and, try and, be, try and be well read, be up with the news, read you know, a whole bunch of different blogs and you know, tumblers and Pinterest pages and all kinds of stuff and just see, pull your, pull your references from as wide a variety of places as you can. So you'll see what I mean by insight in this film. This is a film, um, I'm not even going to tell you what it is, I'll spoil it. Here we go. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? No! Look at that, huh? Look out for cyclists. So that's cool. Now you can imagine that when the brief first came in, you can imagine they're going, right, cycle. Imagine, right, you've got the brief. Look out for cyclists is the brief. So you're thinking, all right, we'll get in the car and we'll just see, maybe we'll camouflage some cyclists or we'll try and, we'll get in the car, we'll drive through and see what cyclists look like on the road or we'll, you know, it'll feature cyclists in some way. This ad didn't even have a cyclist in it. So. So the whole idea is that there's a linear path that your ideas tend to follow, right? So for example, look out for cyclists. Oh, okay, so I'm in my car because it's all about driving and I see a cyclist. No, no, no. This is the, the problem of when you're brainstorming is you have to get off the linear path as quickly as possible. So there's a whole bunch of different techniques that you can use to do that. One of my favorites is to actually open a dictionary at any page, like randomly, and then run your finger down a page and find a word. And then write that word down, and then just try and write as many different words and ideas that come off that word. You'd be really, really surprised, because what's happening is that you're not starting at a linear point. You're starting at a random point, and it's leading you somewhere completely different. So this is a very powerful tool. A lot of creatives use this, actually. So 
The whole idea is you have to start somewhere else. Otherwise, your ideas tend to not get, uh, not be clever enough, you know. The other thing that we do is we create an A4 page and you put 12 boxes on a page and you write one idea in each box. And the whole idea is that each box, the whole idea is you're clearing your head of all of the mundane ideas very quickly. Okay, so cyclists, camouflaged, you know, driving, blah, 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 blah. And then after six or seven boxes, then you've really got to think, you know, what am I going to do? And then you push yourself quite hard to come up with ideas from there. So, and then you do page after page after page. So you do three or four pages, for example, to come up with one or two decent ideas from that. So that's, um, um, that's something that I would suggest that you try, like when, whenever you're trying to think of ideas. And try and find that jumping, like try and find the non-linear way to start. So like use the dictionary, for example. Okay, so, um, so that's the kind of creative side, sort of. And this, the next part of the presentation is much more about the very practical side of just how to get it done, you know. And um, filmmaking has its own dilemmas because actually everything is really expensive, you know. So um, if you don't follow the process and manage risk properly, you could end up in, in a problem. Um, I'll walk you through the process and I'll give you some examples. So someone briefs you, agency or a client. The brief should definitely have who, what, where, when, why, and how. Like, so you'd be very, and this is like 101, but you'd be very, very surprised how often they say, oh, we want to do a film for Ramadan. Oh, okay, well, what do you want to do? Oh, we're not sure. You just go and think of something. Well, that's not a who, what, where, when, why, and how brief. That's just, a, you know. So this doesn't give you enough information. So your client or your agency needs to give you this, at least that much information, if not more. Now, an agency will give you the idea already fully formed. So, for instance, typically, uh, like if you go back to, say, that awareness test ad, they would have already said, look, we've cracked this beautiful idea for this awareness test, we want you to go out and shoot it. And literally your job is just to go and shoot what's already on the board. They would have already thought about it. Everything is there for you to go out and shoot. You would most likely get a storyboard or at least a flow of some sort. A client, on the other hand, will give you more of the outline or general direction that they want to go in. And then from there, you have to crack the idea. So the idea was basically the agency job. Now, for instance, often an idea is not really required. Like if you're doing recipe films, for example, um, you know, you don't really need to sit down and think of a, an idea. What you might try and do, though, is try and work out a really clever way of executing, which could kind of be your proxy for an idea. So, for example, again, we always go back to kind of Maggie Noodles for whatever reason. So Maggie Noodles want to do a whole bunch of recipes. What can you do that's different? How can you take it in a slightly different direction to make it fun and interesting? Is it the way you edit? Is it the way you use graphics? Is it where you shoot them, you know, for example? So, or is it the talent that you use? Like, so you would explore all those different options and try and see if you can think of a fresh way of actually approaching the brief. It's not always possible, but often you, might, you may find yourself in kind of fresh space by going through that process. Now, once you've got that far, you need to create a treatment. And the treatment should have visual references for the style, VO and music references. Um, you need to demonstrate your unique creative vision in this document. You need to sell them on your approach because you're probably going to be pitching against other people. And it's got to be cool and unexpected, surprising, and really visual. So, for instance, what you do not want to do is just have a document with lots of words on it because that's what these guys see every day. They see Venn diagrams and graphs and just words and bullet points and stuff like that. That's not, our world is visual. So you have to come up with a very visual way of selling your idea. Um, and then when you talk about visual references and VO and music, they can in their mind start to see the film come together in their own, in their own mind. So here's the, this is the actual treatment I did for the Canon campaign that you'll see a little bit more of later on. So the idea here was they'd already had a US campaign and we were doing the Middle East version of it. There's a, a really cool travel influencer called Haifa 
Travel with Hyper, which is it's a really cool channel. And the idea was they wanted to kind of emulate this US film, but in a uniquely Middle Eastern way. And her whole persona is that she's the kind of the Muslim girl who's, who's seeing the world. So she has the hijab, and she's more in the traditional style. And, but she's kind of young and fun and quite funky. So the whole idea is that it's the way that she embraces the world. That's her whole thing. So we wanted to be true to that. So what I did is I went to a really cool website. You can do this uh, any, with any kind of photographic website because this document is not really going to, it's not an external document. You don't have to go to Shutterstock and buy images or anything. You just need what we, what we uh, a steel matic or you just need to kind of you know, get these images into your deck as you can. So these are all from Russell Keimer. And the idea is that we wanted to go to the UAE's most unusual places and to give us an unusual look that is visually exciting as well as being a destination travel bloggers would gladly experience. So we're trying to stay true to Hyper's thing but also be uniquely UAE, but not with the glitzy towers and stuff like that. We want to be a little bit more raw and a bit more real. So I've actually come up with her voiceover and then I've walked through what each of the, 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 the shots would be. Okay? So I, I won't bother reading or anything like that. But you can see I've actually spent the time on the voiceover so you can get an idea of the kind of tone with the images. I believe they've shut this place down now um, uh, up in Russell Kaima. This is really cool. I, th I think they're um, redoing it. Okay, so you can see the visual style. Th this was from the American film. I just wanted to remind them of that we're going to be emulating the look of the American film a little bit. Okay, this changed, but, um, but it was um, in the deck. Okay, so as you can see, it's very visual. There's not many words on the page. It gives the idea of the film very clearly. Okay. So once you present that, then that becomes your competitive pitch for the job as a, as a director or producer. Then you've got to cost it out. Now the whole thing is, the one thing to remember is it's very hard to keep a production on track. Like things can spiral out of control very, very easily. For instance, um, you know, you've got your location permits, the actual cost of the locations themselves. I have been mentioned before catering and a few people snickered, so I think uh, people have had experiences with this. But one of the things I noticed is that if you don't feed your crew properly, they very quickly go rogue on you, you know? So you've got to, uh, you've got to really feed these guys well. It's kind of the bizarre thing about filmmaking. That, that, and when I mean feed them well, we're not talking Subway or pizza. We're talking like actual proper cooked meals, you know? It's, I think it's crazy myself, but anyway. Locations are ridiculously expensive. So you can expect to pay fifteen to 25000 per location. Um, permits are, I think, 3000 or thereabouts. Catering is about 120 dirham a head. So if you've got 20 people on set, I mean, do the numbers. Uh, amenities. So are there bathrooms around? If not, you've got to supply those. So all of this stuff you have to take into consideration. You've got talent, hair, makeup, and wardrobe. Now, the thing about wardrobe, and I'm sure because you guys, are, a lot of you are shooting, you already know the dilemma that you have with this, is the wardrobe girl, stylist, she needs a prep day and she needs a return day and the shooting day. So she, you've booked her for three days before you've even spent a cent. And she's not cheap. Um, and the, the hair, makeup, you know, it's like 1500 or 2000 depending on the, what you need. Um, the talent, two and, two and a half for a half day, four for a full day, like that. So, so even, this, even this line item here, is, it's, it's expensive. Production design is a whole new level. And I, I rarely use production design in my jobs because I can't afford it. Because to get, to get uh, an art director to go and create a set for you or to go out and do a lot of shopping or building or anything like that, is really, really expensive. And I would say minimum of minimums, the most basic setup you can imagine is going to be $10,000 with these guys. So, so you try to get your locations that have 
those qualities already built into the set. That's the way I generally work. So I will look for locations that I don't have to dress up. Um, crude lighting grip cameras and DIT. So for instance, with crew, um, and well, I've got slides on this a little bit later on, it's a little bit frightening how this builds up, actually. I'll, I'll, I touch that a little bit later on. Lighting, you've got a gaffer and a couple of sparks, and your gaffer is your best friend. And if, you've never, if you're a photographer and you're moving into filmmaking for the first time, you want to hook up with a really good gaffer because these guys make your life really easy. And they're the ones who do all the magic. 80% of it's in the lighting, actually. So if you work with a good gaffer, half your job is done. Grip is basically the guys who move the camera. Um, then you've got the cameras themselves. And then you've got DIT, which is the digital intermediate technician. And this guy here is really annoying because he's the guy that costs you 2,000 dirham, and he literally sits there surfing the internet all day long but he ingests the material and he does two copies of all of your rushes. And I can't tell you how many times you get a corrupted disc or there's some problem or whatever, and he's the guy that picks it up. So you have to be really, really careful. There are ways of getting around a DIT, which I share a little bit later on, but you really need these guys hanging around on your set. And then you've got your post-production. So the editing, normally you can get away with online films with a basic edit, and sometimes a good editor will actually give you a, a okay kind of a grade as well, a simple grade. But I find that on the uh, your colorist, uh, the guy who does your grading, he's worth gold. Like he's he's going to make your film look really really great as long as you've got a really solid edit. Um, then you've got audio mastering, which which I don't think really we bother too much with these days because you know most of the time if it's online they've got the audio down or it's just on the phone. You don't need like tons of nuance or anything like that, and your music. And music is the big headache. So um, you'll put a film into client, and the client will be, it's fine, but I hate the music. And then you thought the music was perfect. So then you go, you look again, and they hate it again, and they hate it again, and they hate it again. And I mean, I've spent five days looking for music. And the thing is, it's like the sales bin at H&M. You know, you're, you're just literally going through, going, what about this one? Oh, no, I hate it. Okay, well, oh, what about this one? I hate it, and so on. So it's like a bit of a lucky dip, you know? Um, when you're costing, you need to add some kind of buffer because if things do get out of control, then you do need to have some kind of safety mechanism there for you. Otherwise, it's your money that you're spending on the shoot. Okay, so a typical production margin should be around 30%. Like, if you're lucky, you can do 30% on cost. But keep in mind that your client is going to knock you down on price, so be ready. And, uh, and they've got every right to knock you down as well because sometimes, you know, there's a lot of fat in there or there are things that, with a little bit of creative thinking, you can resolve and do cheaper. So they are obviously right to sort of uh, um, knock you down. But once you're commissioned, and once that's set, it's locked, and you cannot ask for more money. So if things go, so if you've decided to undercut someone on a job, and you get that job, be careful. You have to deliver that on that budget, like no matter what happens. I've got an um, interesting example of this one from just recently. I had a big government job just recently. I had a huge crew in from overseas, and I got I got a brief to do a, a film for a, it's a small little little back to school film, I think it was. And because we had the crew around already, I just slotted a day, I priced that day, I got everyone at a very cheap rate because they weren't doing anything anyway. And I costed, I, I costed an A grade, it was like having the Barcelona football team, you know, in, in, playing in the backyard game, you know. I had this top notch team, costed it out, sent it to the client, and they said, no, you're 25% more expensive than the other guys. And I go, no, that's not possible because what I'm giving you, I'm giving you a Ferrari. You're getting a Ferrari here, you know, for the price of a Hyundai. But they said, no, 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 we've got a Kia and it's cheaper like this, right? So anyway, they went with the other guys and the other guys completely screwed the job up and it was a disaster and it was awful. Well, actually, the result was awful. And it just really reminded me that sometimes the clients can be so focused on the budget that they forget what they're getting for the budget. So sometimes you can offer them a lot, like I had in that case, just by my luck. And I told them, 
it's your lucky day because I happen to have this great crew around. But they just couldn't accept in their heads, you know, and they went with the, the other guys. And it was, um, the other guys were just shooting on these little, like, like literally little ENG. We, we had the full cinema camera set up. We had, oh my God, anamorphic lenses. I mean, we had everything in our kit. And they went with these guys shooting ENG. It was really strange. So anyway, um, but it was their, their loss at the end. But it just goes to show, I think, on how sometimes clients are very focused on the money and they can't see past that. So part of your job is to try and work out how you can sell what you've got to offer in, even if it's a little bit more expensive. Okay, there's an LPO that then gets issued. That's a purchase order. And this is the legal intent of the client. And you need to get this. So promise me if you ever shoot professionally and you shoot a film, you have to get this LPO. Because what happens is you're about to sink minimum of $10,000, $20,000 into this film. And if they don't honor their commitment to you, that's coming out of your pocket. And imagine if tomorrow you had to go into your bank account and explain to your wife why <laughs> you're paying out ten or $20,000 on, on something that's not even your fault. Because this happens every day, okay? So you have to get your LPO. There's an old saying, if they can't pay you before, they won't pay you after. So it's really, you have to keep this in mind, okay? So the purchase order is your legal intent, 50% up front or you do not do the job. You don't do it. I'll give you a really interesting example of this. There was, um, I pitched for a job and I got it. And it was for a very big uh, phone brand. They wanted, they briefed us on the Sunday, they wanted the final film by Thursday. And it just wasn't possible. And I told them, I said, it's not possible. And they said, no, you have to do it because they want it, there's some kerfuffle going on, the agency's in trouble and we need it and da da da. Um, I said, well, it's not possible. And I said, okay, if we throw money at it, we might get there. So I said, if you can do this 50% up front, let's get the ball rolling. Maybe, but budget's going to be a bit higher because of the problem of time. And they said, no, we can't do the 50% up front because there's no time to push it through accounts. So I spoke to the producers and team that I work with and we, we, we declined the job. The team that got the job they didn't get an LPO, they didn't get the 50% up front, they paid out of their own pocket, and because of the constricted timeline, they screwed the job up, and they were $100,000 down the tubes, and they went out of business. So that's what happens, because what happens, the agency, the agency have kind of, you know, they've said, oh, well, there's not enough time, or we can't do it, or whatever, but I've been on jobs where I've said to the agency, you have to come up with 75,000 dirham like by midnight or we're not shooting. And literally someone's come knocking on my door with cash and given it to me to get the shoot done. So you just understand that when you're making films, you're in a, it's a completely different world here. Like, so, um, so without the 50% up front, you're in a, a lot of trouble. You need to ideally get 30% at the conclusion of photography, and then you need to get 20% on delivery. But the reality is that mostly they're not going to do this. Like mostly they'll try and leave it for 30 days. But you should ask for this. And, um, and most of the agencies, even though I've given you the warning signs and things, I mean, I've never had a problem with a major agency. It's always been fine. And they've always been supportive. And you've got to talk to the right people, and you've got to keep the lines of communication open, and you have to be polite and, and so on. Uh, when it comes to money, of course, people get weird. So, Now, as your production costs are going to be 70% of the total, you must ensure this money is in your bank because you need to pay suppliers. And most of those suppliers are up front as well. And the thing is, they'll never work with you again if you don't pay them or if you're delayed. So, for example, um, hair makeup, she needs to be paid on the day. Wardrobe, she needs her wardrobe fees beforehand because she's got to go shopping. Okay, so we've gotten through the ugly business of the LPO. Let's never talk about money ever again, okay? But we move now onto the more creative stuff, creating the storyboard and the shooting board. Now, so what happens is that here you've got to plot out every shot in detail. And I like to consider this part as this is my promise to my client and the agency of what I'm going to deliver. So whatever's on my board, that's what I'm promising that I'm going to deliver. 
So what we normally do is I'll show you, it's an it's a A4 page with three columns, visual description on the left, image in the center, audio on the right. And this doesn't have to be perfect. This can all be hand drawn. Um, then the shooting board, all that is, you're just taking the storyboard and you're moving it around in the chronological order in which you're going to shoot everything. Okay? So when you're on the set, there's no creativity when you're on set. Your job is to get the shots. That's it. So all the creativity happens at this point. When you're sitting there at your desk, you close your eyes and you just think, you look at references, you try to imagine what this film is going to be, what angles you want to shoot, how you want to go about it, look for tons of references and so on. Because once you're through this stage, you can't go back and change anything. So this is the point where, um, where you do your real creative work. Okay? This is actually Steven Spielberg's sketch of a scene from um, Indiana Jones. And I'm showing you this because the bar's pretty low. I think we can all do better than Steven Spielberg in this instance. Um, so you can see it's all hand, it looks pretty average. But, and here's what one of my um, storyboards looks like. So this is actually what gets signed off by the client. So as I said before, you've got a bit of a blurb at the, at the top, um, which just runs through the basics of the, um, the, the film. The vi what you're describing the visuals on the left and you're, and you're describing the audio on the right. Um, and then these are actually the shots. And this was kind of workshopped quite extensively. So the agency said, no, 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 this, uh, in this particular instance, we're using all these uh, social media influencers. So they were like, no, this girl is like this, or she would do like this. And this guy, well, we can only get him a hat, so he has to wear the hat. Oh, OK. So I'm kind of crafting a storyboard around the limitations that they've kind of presented. So you can see in the film here, we see a girl doing lipstick. We see the reverse from behind. And there's a, there's a, a scarf here on the, on the edge of a chair. Then we cut to a guy. He's um, doing his hair. He picks up a hat. Then we've got a girl in a mirror, like she's looking at her reflection in a mirror. We see her feet. She's got these yellow shoes. Then we see a dude have two suits. He picks one and throws the other away and puts the, puts the, uh, um, puts the suit on. Um, then, we, uh, then we have um, uh, another dude like flattening down his suit. He's a kind of a cool madman type guy. Then we see a girl walking towards the door. She opens it and she exits, and we see the light on her face. So this was the film that we um, had approved by the client. Okay, so this is actually what we ended up shooting. As you can see, we kind of matched it mostly. There were a few points where we, where we couldn't. So this is the rundown. I'm going to walk you through what happened on that shoot. So basically, locations, permits, catering, amenities, paid on the day. Cast talent on the day. Shopping now, like props, all paid up in advance. Book the crew and so on and so on, all paid on the day. Editor, colorist, and VFX paid on delivery. Budget locked. So all that money that you've, you've, the client's given you, it's all gone. All gone. Okay. So on Schweppes, what we did was we got briefed on a Sunday, and we had to shoot it the following Saturday. So it was quite a full-on uh, week. Um, we found a villa in Rashidia, and we, we managed to get there because it had this cool French antique furniture, and everything was really pale colored. So we thought that this was kind of an okay place to shoot. The client actually hated it. They hated it. They wanted something really funky and modern. But we just couldn't find anything. And in the end, after much back and forward, and it got a bit heated, 
in the end, we, we basically lobbied quite hard for this, uh, this place and, and we got there in the end. The, the talent were all of these top um, influencers. Uh, you probably know some of the names, like Bin Baz and Fatimo uh, Alamin and all this. Um, the wardrobe was basically their own um, because they obviously like to dress themselves to have their own style. But we just added the yellow items and we had someone going out and buying that stuff. Now, in terms of the shoot, what was really interesting is half of that film was shot at night. And how we did that was because we had 9K HMIs out the window. We had a whole stack of them. So basically, we built an entire scaffolding outside the house. And we had these massive 9K lights. A 9K requires a truck as a generator. It has its own truck as a generator. So um, that shows you how big they are. Um, we needed the consistency of that light all day long. So we needed, you know, the thing is, if you're chasing light, as you know, as a photographer, you're chasing light, it's a nightmare. So um, we just wanted the same light all day long. So we went for a bunch of 9Ks outside. Um, on the crew, we had a focus puller and a second AC. So the focus puller, he just has his little focus pulling thing and a little monitor. And this guy is amazing. Like, he just, he's, everything's just pin sharp with him. And, and he was the first, the best focus puller I ever worked with on, on that job. Gaffer and, and two sparks, but we needed an extra guy just to sit with the generator just in case. So the gaffer's the guy who works out all of the fine detail with the light. And then this one we shot Ari with Cook, and we shot Raw for the color depth because we needed to isolate that color, which was a bit of a nightmare. So we edited in color, and we just found a music track on Audio Network. And um, the spot color was isolated in the grade. So it sounds easy enough that we basically went for all the yellow items, everything else was desaturated, and basically lots of power windows and, and, and so on. But actually, the colorist was saying, next time shoot green and let him change the color. Because the sensors, are, as you know, are more sensitive to green. And it would have been just a lot easier to, to isolate the green color and then recolor it as yellow later on. So it was kind of our mistake on that one. OK, so, um, so that's Schweppes. So just to go back, I'm going to try and show you. Uh, we'll watch it again, because I'll, I'll, I'll try and guide you through some of the lighting choices and things. So um, in here, out the window here was the big 9K. This was shot about 6 PM in the evening. Um, and then in front of us, off to one side, we had a 1K. As you can see, it's quite direct in there. But she's got a path that she follows. So she has to stay evenly lit the whole way, which is kind of the nightmare of shooting film. So we'll, we'll, what I'll do is I'll just take you through it. So yeah, that was the 9K out the window there. This was, this was all at night, 9K outside that window. So it looks like daytime. Watch the focus pulling, except forward is pinched out the whole way. That's the focus puller's job. Now, I'll point to a mistake. This was rushed about 10 o'clock at night. So we, we, just, we just got lots of uh, smoke in there. But we literally had to just put um, paper over the doors because the doors weren't right for the shoot at all. We were going to shoot somewhere else, but we ran out of time. And we just had to shoot it however we could. So we just picked it up um, at, the, at the last second. OK, so um, now the treatment you saw for the, this hyperfilm, this is the film. Um, so as we said before, the approach that I took with this one was that she's quite a bubbly kind of character, and she brought along her friends. And what we did is we had to create some moments for her. OK, so one of the problems we had was, what do you do? We've got a 90 second film. What's she going to do for 90 seconds? So we, we brainstormed a whole bunch of cool things that she could do with her friends. Then we found this really cool place in JLT, this, uh, this uh, loft apartment. And, um, and so a lot of the cool kind of bits and bobs here was, were already at the location. So we didn't have to do anything. Everything was already built in, because this was quite a low budget shoot. Um, you can see this light. You can see this here. That's actually an M18, what we call an M18 outside. So it's an HMI light, which is very, very strong, but it's 1,800 watts. It's 
So these are cool lights because you can use them on the house mains. So we had a, a, a M18 out the window, and then we just filled with a Kina flow. I think we had a Kina flow just a, over off the, slightly off the camera position, but up quite high. So that's where her skin tone comes from. This was shot on the C300. So let's have a look. We're born curious with a sense of wonder on a journey to so find yeah, a voice. So yeah, we had to find them things to do. To create our own story. Finding it in the most unexpected places. Him, her, me, and you. Every one of us, a voice and a dream. Mine to be me. They say, hijab on, hijab off, be quiet, be ordinary. They say, be something. But don't be the crazy idea of who you really are. All the things that once stopped me now fuel my dream. Ready to go after yours? Close your eyes and put your finger on a place and just let yourself go. And let's make our lives a story to tell. Do you remember me? So everything slowed down, you as you can see. Remember me? We, we couldn't get a permit to shoot at the Dara market, so I shot it. Uh, everything slowed down, just handheld. And it was like 50 degrees. It was a Total nightmare, but um, but yeah, if you have to shoot handheld, slow it down a bit, and it helps. Okay, so as I've said, Airbnb Villa and JLT. We're in Rasa Kaima, as we mentioned in the uh, treatment, and at the Dera Market. And Dera Market was a last-minute decision. We'd already shot the house, we'd already shot uh, Rasa Kaima, and we realised there's something missing. It needs more, needs a bit more variety. So we went down to Dera and just and stole a few shots uh, from there. Um, Production design was built into the JLT place, actually. And then we came up with four or five little things that she could do. You know, um, blowing the bubbles and cutting out the stars, which then became the bokeh and so on. Um, I already mentioned about the lighting. Um, C300 on that one. Um, it was handheld at Dera Market, but basically you shoot on the sticks with a loose head. So you just kind of let the head go loose and you just let the camera move a little bit. But you're basically on the sticks. The music really helped. That was from uh, the buyout. That was um, for, from the US film. OK, so now on the bigger, bigger shoots, you would end up with this kind of, and this shows you what I was talking about, how things just get out of control. So what happens? You would start with your ARRI Mini and your ARRI Master Primes, or Cooks. Um, to put it in perspective, a Cook, an average Cook is around 20,000 dirham per lens, I think. The Master Primes are more than that. Um, O'Connor legs, these really huge legs. Um, the dolly track or crane or whatever you want to use. You've got your remote follow focus because you've got an operator and the guy, the focus puller is sitting somewhere else pulling focus with your matte box and filters and accessories. This basic setup is around 11,000 dirham to rent for the day. But you've got to have crew. That's just for the gear. You see, you obviously need the DOP. Then um, he's, the, he's the kind of team leader. As I said, you've got your focus pulley. You've got your camera assistant. You've got your DIT. You may have a second AC on that as well. So you'll have one uh, guy maybe operating and another guy changing lenses and changing media and so on. And then you need your digital intermediate, as we mentioned. And that, that crew is going to cost you around 16000 for the day. So just to have the camera and crew is 27,000 dirham. Thank you very much. So um, now online, it's a whole different thing. So you could go with, say, for instance, like the C300, which is what I'm using. I have some Zeiss primes. But the thing with the Canon is that it's got this amazing dual pixel autofocus. So actually, the EF Canon EF lenses are perfect for it. 
I happen to have had the zyphus from a previous life, you know. Um, satchelor legs, and I've got this cool kind of dolly, which is like an industrial sort of size dolly. Um, you'd go with a manual follow focus with a whip, so you'd have your guy looking, you'd turn your monitor towards him, and he would, uh, he would focus uh, with a whip. Um, and instead of your DIT, you use this offload software. And one of the things you may have come across um, if you're moving media around, especially raw files and big files, is if you drag and drop, you've got a fair chance of corrupting something along the way. So what we do is we use this offload software that actually does, it copies the disk image and then checksums everything, data against data. So it, it, it's, it's a completely different way of transferring uh, the data. And this is Red Giant, so you really need this offload software. If you don't have a DIT or anyone around, you really need to use this offload software. It really prevents a lot of problems. You always use two drives. And I generally go with the Lacy's. Um, I used to use those G drives. Oh, geez. And I just I had three or four of them go bad on me, and I just gave up on them. So Lacy's, I've never been let down with a Lacy at all. Um, and you go for two. And the reason why you want two is that one stays with me, and one goes with the producer. And the whole idea is that if I lose it, we have another copy. If one is corrupt, there is another copy, and so on. So you've got to have two copies. It's all about risk management. You've got to be very careful on that. All of this would be my own gear or, or your own gear. And it would be about four. You rent it back to the production for 4K for the day. And then you've got your DOP, your focus puller, just the two of you working together. you know. And that team, if it's you, Pricing it back in would be about 8,000. So as you can see, for 12,000, you've got a much tighter little unit. And this is actually no cost to you. This is all the stuff that you would have anyway. So there's a big difference. Now, um, Canon didn't ask me to say anything about Canon, but I will because I think it's sort of worthwhile. One of the little things, I actually rang them because I spent some time in Los Angeles recently and uh, I was hanging around with a bunch of guys shooting some Netflix stuff. And they're all using the C300 over there because it's cheaper and you can multi-cam quite effortlessly and all the media matches up and so on. But basically you shoot 422 at 10 bit with 50 frames in 4K. That's all you need. And that, Canon delivers that really beautifully. Or you can shoot 444 12 bit if you need to chroma key. The dual pixel is really, really cool. Uh, so you don't need your focus puller if, you, if you're using that. The color science is quite close to ARRI. It's very easy to use the, this C300 as a B cam for the ARRI. And the skin tones are gray, which is what you're after. So the sensor shifts slightly towards green, whereas Sony tends to move more towards magenta. So you can grade both out, but I find that the green, at least that slight green emphasis, results in a nicer skin tone, whereas it's really hard to work with the magenta with a, a nice skin tone. Netflix approved, ARRI's not. No fuss in post-production, but MXF is a pain in the backside for thumbnails. So, um, but once you're ingested, it's actually okay. All right, on to post-production. So you've probably heard this before. You make three films. The film you imagine, the film you shoot, and the film that ultimately you edit. And this is what they say about the feature film guys. That they say, oh, I was imagining it like this, but we ended up with that. But actually, when you're shooting for a client, you, you can't do that. Whatever, whatever you've imagined or whatever's on that storyboard, you have to deliver that film. Um, so you don't have that luxury. But this is something that if you're really in your own creative zone, this is sort of a truism. Okay, so day one, the editor sorts through the rushes and puts together the assembly or a rough cut. It's, very, it's a very good idea to have a separate editor working on your stuff because often they see things that you don't um, they come in with, a fre with fresh eyes and so on. Um, having said that, you've got to trust him. And I honestly believe after 14 years of doing this that that trust has got to be earned. You don't just say, oh, just do it. Like, they have to earn, like, there's too many dodgy editors around. You know, they have to earn your trust, you know. So don't just trust your rough cut to anybody. On day two, the director and editor finesse the film into a director's cut. And during that day, you're searching for music options. So basically, when you present the client, you've got the main director's cut, 
and then you'll have three or four different music options. So I like to go for three, three different options. On the third day, the client or agency will agonize over the film, but they will finally come back with some feedback. Now, the thing is, you have to set their expectations about what they're going to see. Because some, some, generally agencies are good because they're used to seeing lots of film, but oftentimes a client might not have ever produced a film before and they don't really know what they're doing or what to expect or whatever. And if you haven't set their expectations properly, they could be a little bit surprised in what they see. And that will be surprising for you because you thought that you were clear the whole way through. So you have to hold them by the hand. They should be on set. Make sure your client is on set and that they approve every single shot. So normally before we roll, we would say, right, okay, check it out. You like the frame? Yep, love the frame. Okay, you roll. And then at the end, you also you play back as well for them. Okay? Um, for God's sake, don't accept feedback from juniors. And this happens in every agency because you normally have someone that's handling you and often it's not a senior person. And then that person will be like, oh, I think it's long or I don't like that shot or whatever. And sometimes I'll even lie to you and tell you, oh, the client said, because they just want to get their own idea across. So you have to be very, very, you have to be able to sniff out where that feedback is coming from. So I always ask for consolidated feedback. So here's the film. Guys, sit together, work out what you want to do with it, come back with consolidated feedback. So um, sometimes the agency will say, oh, just do this one change before we send it. You can do that. But, don't do, but then you end up with all these bitsy changes all the time. So you've amended the feedback by the fourth day on a duplicate timeline because sometimes you end up going back to the original film. And you've got to be careful how you name everything. You've seen the whole final one, final, 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 version nine and all that sort of thing. So try and come up with a naming convention. So I would do rough, director's cut, amend, amend two, and then to grade when you're ready to grade because you're sending a timeline off with the XML files for grading, and then the final, which has come back from the grade. So try and have some kind of proper naming convention. Otherwise, you'll drive yourself mad. Hopefully, your edit's approved. Then you lock it and you send it to grade. Has anyone here used DaVinci Resolve before? If you haven't, go home and download it immediately. It's free software, and this is the coolest software ever. It's Everyone uses it for grading anyway, but it's got a very, very cool um, nonlinear editing page now. So it's as good as, uh, as Premiere or better. So in your grade, your first step is to take those raw images and you do what we call primary corrections. So you're just color balancing and correcting all the shots together so they work as a cohesive whole. So all the shots are kind of color matched. Then you, you go shot by shot matching. But then once you've done your basic corrections, then you go through and you're doing all the stuff that you would probably be doing on Photoshop with your images, which is, you know, brightening faces and, you know, sort of generally playing around with what we call secondary corrections, which are basically tonal things, brightening eyes, softening skins, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, once you've done all of that, then you can play with some looks. So um, you basically selective color, satin, tone, which is, you know, obviously we all know that but you create, you're creating a look. Um, and then right at the end, now a lot of people will denoise at the start, but I think that DaVinci is so GPU heavy for your computer that it's probably better just to denoise at the end, otherwise the thing will be so slow. Add a little bit of film grain, job done. So there you go, that's your grain. So we're through the whole production process, the final curve, so how do you make it? as a commercial filmmaker? And there's no easy actual answer to that because um, there's a million guys out there, everyone fights for every job. Um, I think that the way to make it, of course, is you have to really understand what your client wants. So you're the expert, they've called you in, and you're the one who has to give them a solution. So, oh, I think if you made a film like this, this is your solution. You have to have a unique vision and most of the really cool DOPs and directors have very distinctive reels. And that's what gets them a lot of work. So if you want that kind of Louis Vuitton look that we were talking about before, and you're a high-end brand, I mean, 
Bruno Avion's your man. You know, you're going to go for him. You're not going to go for a guy who can do that, but then also do food and then also do cars and then also you, you're going to go for the specialist. So often what happens is that as you go further up the tree, you become more of a specialist. So whether it's cars or food or, or whatever. Same as photography. It's a, pretty much the same thing. Um, You've got to price correctly as well, like not be too cheap and not be too expensive and be reasonable value. You've got to hustle like hell. So you've got to know everybody. And the problem in this market is that everyone moves a lot. So you know the marketing director at X company, but then you ring them three months later, they've pushed on, they've gone and had a baby, or they've now moved to Morocco, or they've, you know, la, la, la. There's always something. So people move around a lot. So you've got to stay out there. You've got to meet people. Um, you've got to have a fantastic reel to share. You've got to have work to share. Um, find awesome collaborators. There's too many not awesome people out there. I've just got to say it. Like, you have to find good people because they're going to elevate you. If you find people who are not at that level, they are going to bring you down in one way or another. And I've had, like, personally four or five instances where I've been like badly let down by um, an editor or a DOP or someone that I've kind of trusted a lot and they've kind of dropped the ball. It does happen. So you have to find people. And it takes time, but, you, but these collaborators are going to really make you shine. You want a fantastic gaffer. Um, you want to have an awesome producer or a line producer. You also need to have a strong technical knowledge as well because ultimately... Um, even though what we're doing is all about creating this reality and creating this beautiful piece of poetry, at the end of the day, it's the technical stuff that helps you to bring it all together. And the beauty of that is you know what things cost and you know what work is involved. And this is especially the case with VFX. So you'll go to a V... Because the VFX guys, they kind of get messed around a lot, you know? So what happens is that the client will say, oh, I don't like this, but it's taken them 14 hours of rotoscoping to get that right. You know, so these guys feel very jilted and so they price very high. I'm just saying it, right? So what happens is that you have to know, oh, well, that rotoscope job, I know that that's only a day's work and a day's work is X rate. So therefore, that rotoscope should only cost me this much. You have to know the price of everything. You have to know the work that goes into everything so that you can actually get the best pricing and that no one will kind of take advantage of you. So that's kind of it. We've arrived at the end. Um, I've, I've tried to kind of create as broad a, a presentation as possible, covering as much as I could. Um, I hope it wasn't too piecemeal. I'm happy to answer any questions and um, you know, guide you in any way you like. Does anyone have any questions? What is the lighting for? <laughs> um, lighting, we were just mentioning during the break, as a DOP, lighting is 80% of the job. And li the lighting for film is quite different to the lighting for photography. So it's a whole different um, expertise. Um, there's some really cool websites that you can get. I mean, there's a lot of lighting stuff now online. But one of the guys that you need to follow is Roger Deakins. Roger Deakins has his own website, and he answers questions. And he's answering questions specifically about lighting. And that scene we saw earlier on from Jesse James was Roger Deakins. And he talks in detail about what he did on, on, that, on that shot. So, so you need to kind of really get into all of these great movies and great DOPs and work out how they and deconstruct their lighting. So lighting's 80% of it, definitely. And lighting's where, like I would say, once we're down to the technicals, it's all lighting after that. And most of the time, I don't even move the camera. The camera's on sticks most of the time. So. Okay. No worries. Any other questions? Yes? Oh, B-roll. OK. Well, um, we normally do pickups. They call them pickups, B-roll. Um, same camera most of the time. Um, I have a 5D. Um, normally, we just use the C. 300 for whatever we can and just pick up on the 5D. The thing with these 5Ds, they're very cool, but you should, you should record to an ex external recorder. So that's the basic rule of thumb because what happens internally, they only record 8-bit, so you get a very limited tonal range, whereas when you go to the external recorders, 
even though you've got an 8-bit signal, it's a 10-bit receiver, like the actual, the actual um, um, file will be 10-bit. So you've got a fighting chance of getting something kind of decent there into an external recorder. So generally like a 5D or a C100 or a C200, um, you know, the, the, they're all, um, normally with the B-roll, we just pick up where we can in between shots. So once you've finished a shot, you'll just quickly grab stuff while the makeup artist is doing her thing or, or whatever. Any other